As I shared before, our ordinary services at this time of year often skip from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to he is risen, missing the Christ to crucify him, missing the betrayal of a close friend, missing the pain that Jesus bore, missing his, Jesus' loud cry, it is finished. Missing, taking his cooling, lifeless body from the cross and placing it in a buried tomb. At the very heart of what makes us worship is both Jesus' resurrection and the death that is tied together. As someone once put it, there's no Easter without Good Friday. No resurrection without the sacrifice of Christ, and no salvation without the cross. Now in a moment, you're going to be hearing two scripture passages in parallel, separated by a couple pages in our Bibles. One of Jesus arriving in Jerusalem to the cries and the celebration of the people, and the other of Jesus approaching and being condemned. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, as they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for a false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is this that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need a witness? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat on his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? 
Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what they are saying? Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. Then when he went out onto the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We have just heard of two very different journeys, seemingly filled with mere images of one another. One a journey into town, the other preparing for a journey out of town. And yet both of them happened just the way Jesus said they would. On one journey, the donkey to carry Jesus past celebrating crowds is waiting. On the other, the room to celebrate the Passover is waiting. On one journey, the people who own the donkey cooperate with Jesus. On the other, Jesus cooperates with those who can't come to arrest him. On one journey, a donkey is found to carry Jesus the final stretch to Jerusalem. On the other, Jesus will carry his cross out of Jerusalem. On one journey, the crowd shouts out, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. On the other, the priest and council curses Jesus and spits upon him. On one journey, the people lay their cloaks in the road for Jesus to ride upon. On the other, the high priest tears his clothes in revulsion. The common people celebrate. The religious elite agitate. Two very different beginnings of what appear to be two different journeys. On one, everything seems to be going great. On the other, everything seems to be going very wrong. Thank you. How can it be that these such different things and different responses could happen to the same person, particularly in such a short period of time? Who is this Jesus? Who must he be to bring out these different responses? Some lay down their cloaks as a royal welcome that Jesus could write upon them. Others tear their own cloaks as signs of anger upon Jesus acknowledging that he is the long-awaited Son of Man, the Messiah. Those greeting Jesus proclaim their alliance that he would be the one who, who comes in the name of the Lord to right the wrongs and to restore Israel. 
And yet Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends and followers, the rock upon which he would build his church, when pressed, denies even knowing Jesus. One crowd adores Jesus, the other spits on him. Jesus was nailed to a cross, but he was carried in upon a donkey. Perhaps the most important part is obscured by our ideas of what success means, what greatness is, that they are found in adulation rather than in humility in the sacrifice that Jesus shows us. That's found in being served rather than serving, receiving rather than giving. But perhaps the answer to how do these different journeys fit together is found in the fact that it's really not two, but it's one. It's not success followed by defeat, followed by success at Easter, but it is instead a part of God's plan. For this is the same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead, experiences that death for himself. We have the prophets that prophesied, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lo, our king comes to us triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, in the prophecies, we find this description of the same Messiah. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our uh, trans, excuse me, he was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus is weak. Is the fulfillment of this range of prophecies that all fit together: exaltation as well as humiliation. We can't separate the Jesus for whom the people cried hosanna from the Jesus that was rejected as people cried out, "Crucify him!" You know, sometimes I wonder. If our eagerness to be in the praise of shouting Hosanna, but having a reluctance to know Jesus who was battered, abused, and murdered. To know both, rather than clinging to one and avoiding the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us perhaps keeps us from knowing and experiencing the reality of all that Jesus is. And perhaps keeps us from living the life that Jesus calls for us to live. That we run towards celebration. And we don't even want to be honest with ourselves about pain, disappointment, abandonment, Need. And if we can't be honest with ourselves in those things, it's awful hard to be present and to be that light to others who are suffering those same things. You, you often hear it come out of my mouth because I just, this passage both resonates and challenges me from Philippians, often called the Christ hymn. That the Jesus who did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. He had that in his hands. But instead, he emptied himself. Being found in the form of a king, a president, a prime minister. (laughs) No, he emptied himself being found in the form of a servant being born into human likeness. Not a poof of fire and there's a great Oz, but instead, a human baby reliant upon a mother for every need. 
being born in human likeness. But not only that, Jesus became obedient, even to death on the cross. That this is the one who didn't exploit his being one with God for himself, but emptied himself for us. And yet, watch this pattern here. There's an emptiness. There's a uh, laying oneself out. But there's also a raise, rising, because it says, Jesus, who is raised upon him, all knees will bow, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet the, dare, the Apostle Paul dares to say of this passage, before he even starts on that, let the same mind be in you, <laughs> which was also in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, surrendered himself to the cross, but was raised to power and glory. Let our minds be like that of receiving great power and praise, but becoming obedient, even in the greatest sacrifice, knowing that even then God wins, our redemption draweth nigh. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, he'd already prophesied. He was going to Jerusalem where he'd be betrayed, he'd be beaten, and he would be killed and that he would be raised on the third day. Jesus speaking of this precedes the shouts of Hosanna. And he wasn't wrong, was he? Who is this Jesus who's worthy of the praise where every knee will bow and every tongue confess? It's the Jesus who humbled himself to the glory of God's only Son, Becoming the humiliation of the crucified Christ. To see Jesus as worthy of glory, honor, and praise is the same Jesus who was crucified, dead, and buried. Now, if your mind isn't kind of going, eh, <laughs> how can that be? You aren't listening, and I'm not communicating it well enough. Because it ought to jar our minds. Sometimes we become so familiar with it that we don't, we lose track of how startling it is. We lose track of what it means. The one that was equal with God emptied himself. That the one being born in human likeness was also the one who, in human form, in human flesh, was to be nailed to that cross. Therefore, it's almost a shame that we're long past the WWJD jewelry, bracelet, posters, bumper stickers. But have we thought in terms of the cross when we ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Oh, they'd go down the road and they'd shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. What would Jesus do? He'd give himself so powerfully for the sake of others that others are cursing him, spitting on him. His friends deny him because his friends weren't willing to take that step. Now, I'll confess that I've often felt like Peter who's denied Jesus, and I know I'm not alone, but I'm not going to ask you to raise hands. You know, oftentimes we treat the question of what would Jesus do in this circumstance as, you know, do you think Jesus would have a second cupcake? When what would Jesus do is actually give of them himself in a costly way, a painful way, not because the person deserved it, but because they needed it and God's love them. God loves them. So we shouldn't be surprised 
when our own lives are filled with both celebration as well as sacrifice, humility, giving, and sometimes suffering. You know, it's an amazing gift to be loved by God. So much that, how amazing is it that there be a greater celebration in heaven over one sinner that repents than 99 people who have their act together? Do we live like that? Do we join in that party? Do we join in that celebration of giving of ourselves, loving, speaking the truth in love to that one sinner that we might throw a party and join the angels? (laughs) As Jesus laid down his life out of great love, if we're going to follow that same Jesus, we shouldn't be surprised when our own path follows that of Jesus in humility, service, and suffering for the sake of others. You know, perhaps we don't pay enough attention to uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The humility of that Peter couldn't imagine that, no, you can't wash my feet. That'd be wrong because I'm not worthy of it. And yet Jesus set aside that worthiness because he, Peter didn't deserve Jesus to wash his feet, but Jesus did it. And then comes one of the really hard parts in the Bible. <laughs> If I, your master, can do this for you, so also, what? You should do so for one another. Are we willing to do so for one another? Are we willing to take the dirty parts of someone's life, hold it in our hands, and wash it? if it takes sacrifice, if it takes kneeling, if it takes humbling ourselves. I love that at uh, Central Presbyterian Church in Atlanta where I sometimes served in their homeless program. Um, I was never there the evenings that they were doing this, but they had some uh, orthopedists and some doctors and nurses come in once a month and they washed homeless people's feet. Not, it certainly was needed to ingrown toenails, uh, various funguses and diseases from not changing socks, being out in the wet. But it was also a gift to people that others would reject. That these people would take their smelly, often nasty-looking feet. Wash them, lotion, medicines as necessary to make them clean. If I, your master, can do so for you, so also you ought to do for one another. There's times for hosannas. There's times for Easter. But Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. So I believe that we often fail to experience the truth of Jesus because we overlook the cross. We joyously celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as well as his resurrection. But it's at the cross where we get the glimpse of God's greatest love. But we also find our example of how we are to love one another but not only those that we think might deserve it, not only those that we think are like us, but Jesus died for us while we were still sinners, while we weren't worth it, while we totally rejected him. He initiated that gift. The truth is that if we do what Jesus calls us to do, It's not so much about saying no 
to all these big lists of sins. As much as it is saying, yes, 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 to the things that God calls us to. Because as we take those steps, as we say yes to God, as we live as Jesus who humbled himself, those other things are revealed as worthless. Because we are entering into God's kingdom and into God's heart. As we say yes to humility, generosity, and service, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem can't be separated from his crucifixion. But they're part of the one and the same Jesus of his purpose for our salvation, but also as our model for our hearts, our minds, and our lives. And both are the path to resurrection, not only Jesus's, but also our own. Amen? Amen. Amen.